Do you hear what I hear? It's those merry pod boys, those holly jolly boys, spreading the Christmas fear and cheer. I'm the pod Y, Matisse Van Rossum, and I'm podcasting after midnight. Oh, shit. Um, I'm Cleveland Mosier, and uh, somebody got me wet. <laughs> 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 I'm Baby Yoda, or uh, I'm Ben Sheets. <laughs> Excuse me. And we're joined this evening by a very special guest, returning from our uh, Return of the Living Dead episode, John Ostrom. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. And tonight, we are talking about gremlins. All right. For those who have been living under a rock forever, Gremlins is a 1984 film directed by Joe Dante and starring uh, Zach Galligan, Phoebe Cates, and Hoyt Axton. And it is the story of a boy who inadvertently breaks three important rules concerning his new pet and unleashes a horde of malevolently mischievous monsters on a small town. This is my first time seeing this movie. You've seen the second one plenty, is what you were saying. Yes, I have seen Gremlins 2 uh, several times. Which is but... an interesting perspective, because Gremlins 2 is very different. Yeah, me coming at it from the opposite perspective. I've uh, seen this film before, and uh, I have a, a weirdly deep familiarity with this film, but I've never seen the sequel. Well, the sequel will be an episode for another day, but John... As our guest, why don't you tell us a little bit about Gremlins? Yeah, uh, it's probably it's probably one of the movies that I've seen the most throughout my life. It's up there and just movies I grew up with and, and the stuff that was kind of family friendly, but also dark and twisted at the same time. And that's that's the stuff that was awesome. I thrived on. Uh, so I've seen that a whole bunch. Um, and just it being a holiday movie absolutely adds to the appeal. The ability for it to be like wacky and almost like Looney Tunes, which I know Joe Dante is 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 really well known for. Uh, I just love it. It's so off the wall. And yeah, it hits that perfect balance of like family movie and horror movie. If I remember correctly, this was the first movie to ever get a PG-13 rating. Right, yeah. Uh, well, actually, no. Uh, it was one of the first ones that made the PG-13, and I think might have been Poltergeist was the first. I'm not quite sure on that. Yeah, uh, but I know that sounds... uh, it was... Oh, no, it was Red Dawn. Red Dawn mm. was the first PG-13 uh, Gremlins and Temple of Doom were the ones that made them consider the PG-13 because they were oh, both wow, really? they're both PG as it is, and that that's what they were like. Well, this is a little too violent to be PG, but not quite enough for R. So they were like, let's just put a 13 on there and allow teenagers to see it. Interesting. I'm more familiar with Joe Dante's stuff like The Howling, which is a, a, a fantastic werewolf film. But uh, he has a really great sense of direction and also has a legacy of working with, like, really great creature effects, really good puppets. Yeah. Something that's definitely apparent in The Howling, but also, like, Gremlins is just chock full of that. Yeah, like, Gremlins in particular, brim. it had the budget mm -hmm. to do really amazing stuff with it. The points of articulation on all of the Mogwai are incredible for practicals. It's crazy. Yeah, there's like there's details of like the way their their cheeks move mm -hmm. and the, the their eyebrows lips. and just the little bits yeah. that move here and there, and it moves also fluidly. And like those parts aren't even stop motion; those yeah. are just animatronics straight up. We just had to take a break to deal with some technical difficulties, and we've forgotten where we were, which is appropriate considering that Gremlins are apparently little beasts that fuck up your electronics. The gremlins are in the damn computer. It wouldn't be a gremlins episode if we didn't have gremlins in the computer. <laughs> it's all those foreign parts. <laughs> <laughs> yep, as uh, the late, great Dick Miller says, it's all those fucking foreign parts. This movie has a lot of really fantastic like bit parts and cameos on that subject. Yeah. Dick Miller pre-sexual abuse Corey Feldman. Um, uh, Jonathan Banks Jonathan was a fun Banks? bit role. Right, that yep. was one I was not expecting to see that uh, really delighted me. It's always fun to see him, especially outside of the Mike role, where he's just, like, so stoic and deadpan and everything. To, like, see him, like, have some personality is, is really fun. Yeah, just not see him as, like, a straightforward cop bodyguard yeah. you know just like you know, dicking around yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> and uh the voice of gizmo was howie mandel yep 
Oh shit! Well. Really? <laughs> oh my god! As uh, famous by who wants to be a briefcase or whatever that. <laughs> right. <laughs> pick a pick a number of the show. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, uh, I would say that this is a Christmas movie only in the sense that it is set during Christmas. I really like that. I think that it provides a fantastic setting with this like cute little snowed in town with all of its quaint holiday decorations. Uh, it, it provides a really nice backdrop, but the movie doesn't need to be about Christmas. It can still be a Christmas movie without being about Christmas. Yeah. Um, I did see that th that it was written by Chris Columbus, who did Home Alone. So what is his penchant for Christmas movies? Right. Yeah. Something. There's yeah. something there. <laughs> Just it's like, it's like Shane Black. Guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Exactly. All Shane Black's movies are like Christmas time and all that. He just, you know, it's in his blood. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> Gremlins kind of has uh, a similar sort of pacing to Home Alone as well. There's a lot of, like, setting up all of the characters, setting up payoffs, Chekhov's guns, or in this case, Chekhov's swords, all kinds of things that will get little callbacks later. And then there's, like, a turning point halfway through the movie where just, like, really wacky slapstick hijinks starts. And in that way, it's just like Home Alone. Yeah. Well, they really emphasize how slapstick and goofy it's going to be from the jump with the father figure being yes. an inventor and making all of these eccentric inventions that usually don't work as expected. Yeah, that's a, a, a really funny continuing gag is just seeing his family trying to use all of his inventions around the house and then them just going horribly wrong and making a huge mess. Yeah. It's just it, like, there's just, they're just kind of like a, like a, a resolved wariness. It's like, <sighs> dad's back at it with the, with the inventions again. <laughs> yeah. That bit never gets old. And it, I know. it really, it really keeps the film going during the, the early setup before the gremlins really take off. Yeah. It's kind of a slow start, but it really lets you get to know the characters and get a sense for who everybody is and develop feelings for all of the characters. So I think yeah, I like it. It's it's one of the few times that you see like genuine prop comedy in a movie. Yes. Yes. True. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes with the corresponding Looney Tunes uh, sound effects. Exactly. The, yeah. The bonking and the, the, the tweeting birds around the head and stuff like that. It's a live action cartoon. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Joe Dante would go on to direct the live action Looney Tunes movie. <laughs> <laughs> comes around for full circle. He does it very well. It, it's weird to see uh, the the more uh, lighthearted side of his his filmmaking with stuff like this and Gremlins too, as compared to stuff like The Howling, which is more serious and the creature effects are more horrifying and less funny. That being said, there's there's a sense of the the grotesque in some of the the creature designs in this. I think, Absolutely. especially uh, uh, once the, the the Mogwai start to turn into the Gremlins and they've got the the weird like alien uh, seed pod invasion of the body snatchers esque pods. Right. Yeah. Yes. And there's even the scene where they they're, they're watching TV or the uh, uh, Gizmo is watching TV. And he's watching the old invasion. Yep, yeah, invasion yeah, of the body snatchers. Exactly. Yep. Uh, that was a, a really nice touch. Uh, go and listen to our episode on invasion of the body snatchers. <laughs> uh, that that got a moment from all of us going ah. It's our birthday special. Yes, one of my favorite uh, kooky characters in this because there's a lot of them is uh, Mrs. Deagle, the villain who's buying up uh, or foreclosing on all of the people's houses. She uh, continues to come to Billy's job at the bank and threaten to murder his dog in extremely <laughs> violent ways, like throw it in a dryer for a while. Yeah, with the heat on high and just like really graphic explanations of what she's gonna do to this dog it's like oh my god <laughs> what a horrible bitch <laughs> the way that she's portrayed in that movie it always every time i see it it reminds me of like a hanna barbera cartoon i could see her as animated and just having the same mannerisms and the way she speaks and everything she just looks like a villain from one of those cartoons and it all just kind of goes back into his his huge way of being cartoony yeah, yeah it is very cartoony in her portrayal i also love how at the end it's mentioned that 
Her uh, husband was a stock swindler. It's like just this cartoonish level of villainy. (laughs) Right. Well, I mean, even in the first scene where she's introduced as she's going to the bank, she gets stopped by this uh, this woman with her two children who's uh, about to have her house foreclosed on just like begging for for another chance, you know, to not lose her home. And she's just like. Just like the bank, all I care about is making money. <laughs> now you know what to ask Santa for Christmas. It's like, Jesus Christ, such such a, a cold, cruel woman. And such like a lighthearted film, stuff like threatening to murder the dog is just like such a weird, really dark uh, place to go very briefly, which we see another couple of in later in the movie. Like, uh, with the, the, the girlfriend's, uh, story about why she hates Christmas. Oh, yeah, it's so dark. It takes such a turn. Yeah, I know, because, like, we learn early on that she doesn't, uh, like Christmas for some reason, and, uh, she finally tells him later, she's like, my dad disappeared around Christmas time, and then we smelled something in the chimney, and the firefighters came in, and they pulled the corpse of my father out of the chimney. <laughs> Apparently a lot of executives wanted that scene cut. Really? Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. It's, it is it's extremely dark. It is. It's so, it's so dark. Uh, Spielberg was one of them that actually wanted it cut because he wanted it to lean just a little bit more into the family side and thought it was just too dark for it. But then Joe Dante explained that that, that is the movie. Like, that explains yeah. the balance that goes on in that movie. Which is a balance that I really appreciate. It's a nice juxtaposition for all of the, the like, great laughs to get these moments of sort of out-of-character, macabre <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> like, the the dog and the and pulling, uh, pulling dad from the chimney. It's like, that's the day that I learned that Santa Claus wasn't real. It's like, oh my God. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Yeah, like, having Christmas uh, as a setting is a wonderful touch, I think, because the the broad strokes metaphor, you know, of this film is sort of like anti-consumerism. It's interesting that this movie came out the same year as Ghostbusters. Oh, shit, You know, which is, like, very, like, pro, like, Reagan, three guys starting their own business, and, you know, juxtaposed to this film, both horror comedies as well. You know, it's, it's very much about, like, capitalism and greed getting out of hand. I think that's that's kind of fun. Yeah, that is cool. I didn't realize that they were both Two, from the same year. Yeah, polar opposite takes. That's a, a a great example of the themes of the movie because we've already established that like Mrs. Deagle is like your your sort of cut and dry capitalist. She she even says that she cares more about m- making money than about making people happy yeah, to a cartoon degree. You're a Scrooge Smithers type exactly, of character. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then when the Gremlins take over the town, what are they doing? They're pretending to be human, but like the most debauched mm-hmm. uh greedy hedonistic side of humanity chain smoking multiple cigarettes getting drunk <laughs> breaking everything just like consumerism on on steroids you gotta love the little like tom waits gremlin like yeah. in that one <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, the God. noir gremlin yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That whole bar scene is is one of the best set pieces in the movie. It's incredible. There's just like, I I can't imagine how difficult it would have been logistically to shoot that because there's so many gremlins there and they're all puppets. Countless days and, of man hour. And they're all like moving and doing different things all in the same shot. You got the one swinging around on the on the ceiling fan and to have uh, the, the girlfriend behind the bar just like trying to serve all of them <laughs> and just being like, please don't bite me, please don't bite me. <laughs> <laughs> lighting their cigarettes for them and shit like that. The amount of effort with the animatronics and the puppetry is always just astounding, it, yeah. especially in those set pieces like that. But I find it really funny how a lot of that really eccentric stuff was really thrown over the top by the second one. And oh, they yeah. really take that stuff and turn it to 11. I forgot how much it's still in this movie, though. Like, there's so many really cartoony gremlin character types in this. Oh, yeah. Well, what I love about it, too, is what helps it not feel, like, too much, uh, which in the case of Gremlins 2 is, like, the excess is the point. But what helps in this movie is that, like, for a 
good chunk of the movie, like they really keep their cards close to the chest and they and they pull their punches, how they uh, withhold information from us and wait to to reveal the the creatures at key moments. Like uh, even when the dad goes into the 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 shop in Chinatown at the very beginning and finds uh, Gizmo in that scene, we only hear him. We don't see him. And they they take a long time before we finally get the reveal shot of him coming out of the little box. And like, oh, look at this cute little fluffy bat-eared goblin creature. And at that point, it's, it's like, oh, how sweet. And then they wait so long to show the antithesis of that in the gremlins. We see their eggs and we see that they've hatched and we get these little hints of their shadows and like their hands and stuff, but we don't actually get the reveal until way later on. And then it's like, ah, how repulsive. Yeah, well, for the first half of the movie, a lot of that stuff is told through the reactions of others. Yeah. You know, we get a lot of close-ups of people's face as they see what's happening without seeing it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that kind of our imagination fills in the gaps in those areas and it works really well. And then when it goes off the wall in the second half, it's all the more fun. They kept it from you for a little while. And then when they finally reveal it, then it's just like, okay, well, here's the, the Royal flush. Here's all of the cards on the table and we can just take it to totally crazy extremes. So John, any uh, particular like uh, characters that struck out to you, or um, gremlins, or sequences? Well, uh, always memorable for me is Mrs. Deagle. Yes. That's always like one of <laughs> one of the, the biggest, most yes. memorable. And her death scene, I think, is like it's hard to say the most over the top because of how many things happen in that movie. It's my favorite. But thing, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, on a first viewing, it was mine too. That that got the hardest laugh out of me. I don't know if they, they, these things were ever written into it, but like the the things that the gremlins say. And just the little words that they pick out and that her name was one of the things. And it just works so well when they just say Deagle, 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 Deagle. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, a lot of the Gremlins lines were uh, improvised by the voice actors. Okay, so that, that makes sense. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. yeah. Because a lot of it is just is just incoherent noises and then saying a single word, usually what they're looking at. Gun. <laughs> right, yeah. The best ones. But back to the, the Mrs. Deagle death scene, because that whole scene is so masterfully executed in the way that it delivers information. At that point, she's been gone from the movie for a while. It's like you've kind of forgotten about her because of all the other crazy shit that's going on. And then we cut to her house, and the first shot we see is her coming down this massive grand staircase on one of those little, like, chair lifts. And she's got a cat in her her lab and she's like baby talking the cat and then we see that her house is full of cats it's like okay that's why she hates dogs because she's a crazy cat lady also one of her cats is named dollar bill (laughs) 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 the epitome of capitalism But then, like, we see the one gremlin in her house, and we see that it's, like, chewing on the wires of her of her chair lift, and then hearing, like, caroling outside, and we, before they've showed us that there are, like, people going around caroling, and then she opens the door, and it's a bunch of gremlins caroling. And I love that, like, the little subversion there is they go from singing, like, Silent Night or whatever to singing the gremlins theme song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, like, uh, one of those, like, little nice breaks of the fourth wall, yeah. but, like, not too out of place. Just enough, yeah. And then she runs back inside and gets on her chairlift, and it launches her all the way up <laughs> and out the front window. Murdering her. <laughs> Just that incredible, that incredible wide shot of her house and the, the dummy that is her body just flying out the top window <laughs> is one of the funniest shots in cinema history, I think. I was laughing so hard during that. I love the tracking shot of her just going up the floors. Yeah. Uh, screaming. Super, yeah. <laughs> During that tracking shot, there's one of the paintings in the background, or it's like a portrait, a giant portrait. It's knocked sideways. Yeah. And its eyes follow her when she goes up really? like, very quickly. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. I didn't notice the <laughs> eyes. Yeah. I, noticed, touch. I noticed her knock the oh, painting. Great. I was like, that's a really great touch. That fantastic attention to detail that I feel like is lost from so many modern films where you just have all of these little things that have been set up before and get some kind of satisfying payoff or subversion. 
uh, like the the swords uh, in uh, in Billy's house. Every time they come in and shut the door, one of the swords falls off the wall. Obviously, gonna use that sword at some point, and sure enough. They do. <laughs> he uses the sword to fucking slay some gremlins. Yeah, which is... yeah, lops its head off, and you get that wonderful shot of just the gremlin head in the fireplace burning. Well, I, I love when they attack his mom in the kitchen, too, after they first hatch, and she just, like... Yeah, she gets the first kill. She, she very quickly dispatches a couple of them. The one that's drinking out of, like, the big blender cranks that shit on and then throws one into the microwave and n- nukes it, and we get that fantastic spray of green gremlin blood against the... Yeah, it's particularly gruesome for a family movie well that's the thing it's like all of the like violence and gore we see is like the the gremlins themselves so it's like i think they can get away with it because it's not people it's little green shithead monsters yeah with the people i think the the worst you see is like somebody gets scratched yeah right every (laughs) everything else they always die off camera they cut right before like with uh with dick miller and his wife getting uh murdered by that the snow plow right (laughs) yeah the the, the school teacher the biology teacher yeah when he was you know experimenting and you know figuring out what was going on I, I thought that was so funny that after billy gets gizmo wet and and uh the little little pods come off he takes one to his biology teacher like if i wanted answers on anything scientific one of the last people i would have got to is my high school biology <laughs> teacher like she didn't give a shit <laughs> the foremost knowledge of science in that town is at the kingston falls high school <laughs> <laughs> that's right Oh, on the subject of the town, that opening shot you pointed out, John, is the uh, the same set from Back to the Future. It is, yeah, and I think they were filmed around the same time. I don't know. I don't know if they came out around the same time. I'm not sure. Th- uh, but they're both produced by Spielberg, so there's there's definite right? things in common there. I think Back to the Future so. came out in like 84 like 85, 85, 86, maybe. So, yeah. I want to say. Like- yeah, um, not certain. So Grandma is before. Obviously, a, a Hollywood backlot, but yeah, that that nice establishing shot of the town. I had never seen this movie, but I did know that it used the same the same main town set, and, uh, a lot. and yeah. yeah, and and it's it's nice. It's just covered in snow, so it's like a nice little nod to right. uh, to to each other, which are both you know fantastic, fun '80s films. It's nice to to see that that little bit of. Uh, that little tie-in, I think. Yeah. There's a, a, a nod to, uh, the, yeah, the movie theater, the, a nod to the other Spielberg movies. The, the, the titles on the marquee is uh, oh, yeah. A Boy's Life and Watch the Skies, I think, is the other one. And that was the working titles for E.T. and yep. uh, Closing Counters. It's Watch the Skies, the E in the was capital E. Oh, ET. gotcha. Okay, I didn't yeah. notice that. Oh, that's why yeah. that was. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. my God. You're mm-hmm. right. Because I noticed the, the E was larger and a different color. I'm like, why is that? E. I, that was... Yeah. That's a reference that went over my head. And Spielberg had a little cameo, too. I never would have noticed it, but you pointed that out, John. Right, yeah. At the, at the uh, It was the Inventors Conference that yeah. the father goes to, and he's he's on the payphone, and he's talking to the family, and there, there's a dude just riding around on, like, this little scooter thing, and it's Steven Spielberg. That's great, because, like, you never really see his face well enough to tell that it's him, but it's like you pointed it out, and it's like, Oh yeah, I can kind of see it. It's just the student in the background on a bike. That scene has a lot of like little things that happen in the background that I always like. There's like Fantastic Voyage. Is that what it is? The robot that it looks like I that's right so. behind it's him. It's like yeah. Lost in Space. Lost in yeah. Space. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, uh, it's a robot a lot like that. It's talking on the phone. And one of the things it says on the phone in the background is, uh, "No, sir, I don't recommend it. It promotes rust." And it's like <laughs> <laughs> just a random line that I've always enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing a little cowboy hat. He is. Too. Yeah. <laughs> totally like at a fallout <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> just in general the the production design of this film is fucking fantastic the sets are so good i bet they were really fun to just trash because that's all the second half of the movie is it's just trashing all of these places that you've seen set up in the movie beforehand Right, especially uh, I always think of the, uh, the the sporting goods store that just gets completely destroyed. The gremlins are like the embodiment of chaos. They're not that dangerous all on all on their own, but when you get uh, a, a thousand of them swarming all over the town, what the fuck are you supposed to do? Well, <laughs> trick them into a movie theater and set it on fire is what you're supposed to do, I guess. Hey, that works. <laughs> I, I love I love the shot when they're running out of the movie theater and we have the moment where the projector stops working and the our protagonists are behind the screen and the gremlins see their silhouette 
and it cuts back to our, our protagonist looking back at the gremlins and we just get this shot and they just projected it onto the screen yeah. of the gremlins like getting up and you have these like cool like, shadow yeah. image of the, the the swarm like coming at them like i like that they animated that you know kind of brought the cartoon back into reality well seeing them all in in the movie theater too is really great they they all love uh snow white and the seven dwarves and they all are, are singing along with uh, hi ho off to work we go it's a uh, just a really uh a really fun little scene well apparently disney was gonna make a gremlins or a, a disney-esque film about gremlins or something at some point okay i don't know an about animated that. movie i, uh, I like, know there was there there was like old looney tunes like cartoons thing. that were kind of about gremlins like in the way that, that they get into machinery and there was like these little creatures but like that's all I know about that. Interesting. Was that the the impetus for for this film? I think yeah, for like just the basis for the idea. Dick Miller says that mm-hmm. like anytime your your machines aren't working, it's because there's gremlins in it. It's not quite so literal in this movie, but most of what they do is is break into machines and tear them up and make them faulty and haywire. Especially like right when he's about to get run over by the snowplow and he's like, I was right. There's gremlins in the machines. I was right. <laughs> his final words. Yeah. Which right. is the, the funniest part. He got his validation before he died. <laughs> I love his performance when he's completely sloshed coming out of the bar. Oh, like he's, yeah. he's like the most, the most charming drunk in that scene. <laughs> Yeah, he is. He's he's offering to help her clean up the bar if she'll just give him one more beer and then tries to get into his snowplow and can't get it started. He's like, I think you should probably walk home. He's like, you know what? I think I'll walk home. <laughs> <laughs> he's fucking great. I love every time he's in something. He's such a great character actor. Yeah, like his his like his like casual xenophobia like is is like is almost charming. Like it's <laughs> with the with the TV uh-huh. when he uh, slaps it and it comes on to the Spanish language channel. He's like, oh, it's the foreign channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, doesn't matter touch. what kind of foreign, just if it's not america it's not about it i mean it was the 80s it was the cold war mm-hmm. anything who's not american is not okay by me exactly yep yep <laughs> being a wwii veteran as he says <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> fuck that's great another one of my favorite uh set pieces is uh when billy chases the the main evil gremlin to the ymca stripe Stripe, that's right, because he's got the he has mohawk. a mohawk. He has yep. a mohawk. Um, so he knows a bad boy gremlin. That's right. Anybody who's got a mohawk is a bad boy, uh, and he is the the baddest of boys. But I, I just love I just love when he he jumps into the into the swimming pool and it just starts bubbling and frothing and foaming like apocalyptically. We just get that shot panning out with all the the green lights coming up from under it. It's yeah. such and a, they managed to get like Billy like running out of out of the building just before the that that massive roll of fog covered over yeah. like that entire portion of the set. Like and then to get that really cute uh, stop motion shot of the the town street with all of the little gremlins coming out of the shadows and like, oh shit, there's like hundreds of them now. You just love to see it. You love to, to see back when they, they made all of those effects by hand. Yeah, I was I was trying to look it up and I couldn't find anything before the movie because I was I was wondering about it because some of that like stop motion reminded me of like some of the go motion stuff that like Lucasfilm did in Star Wars and whatnot. And I know like with the <laughs> Steven Spielberg Association, I was I was trying to find anything about it on like who did the any of the motion stuff. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the same team worked on it. Lucas and Spielberg had such a connection with Indiana Jones. Uh, they even yeah. reference that uh, near the beginning with the the billboard with all the Indiana Jones font. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if they carried over a lot of the special effects team because it does look quite similar to some of the Star Wars puppetry. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Yeah, well, I mean, like Salacious Crumb is basically a gremlin. Damn, you're right. <laughs> For all those who, uh, you know, just aren't tracking that deep cut, Salacious Crumb is the weird Muppet who uh, sits next to Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, you're right. He is. He's got the big bat ears he, He's got everything. the whole thing going for him. He's the OG gremlin. Yeah. 
He started it all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> back back to the subject of the the effects. Like some of them are really impressive, especially like the the close ups that they get of Gizmo. I know that they for those they had to build a a, a much larger version. Oh, so they like they did with the original King Kong. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. So oh, like neat. we we have like the 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 little animatronic Gizmo puppet that we see a lot of times, but all the ones where it's like a really tight close up and you're getting all of the nuances of like his face moving. They built one that was like people size. Yeah. For all those close ups. Cool. And like at the end when he's driving his little pink car around the sporting goods store and you've got those close ups and it's obviously got the the projected background. Uh, I love that shit. He is a he's very cute. I know everybody knows what Gizmo looks like in the in this day and age, but it's a very adorable puppet. It's true. <laughs> they designed him well, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah they did. They yeah. did. And and like you, you know, you you get worried for him at times, you know, especially when the gremlins first hatch and they like have him tied to the dart board and they're like throwing the darts around. It's like, oh no, don't hurt Gizmo. He's so sweet. And he's he's the one that always behaves. Like even right. in the beginning, before they even become gremlins, like when they're playing around under the Christmas tree and a bunch of them are playing like arcade games and like blowing up a train, little toy train. And Gizmo's sitting on the side, just playing with his little trumpet. Yeah, oh, <laughs> that's right. Well, yeah, for some reason, all of the other Mogwai that, that come out of him are like nasty, rude boys. They try to bite Corey Feldman. Gizmo is just like he's he's the one good boy the whole movie. You know, no it's because matter what. he was trained. That's yeah, I guess know? so. He was, he was trained by the old Chinese man. Yeah, he knows how to behave himself. Honestly, it's a good thing that 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 the dude came back at the very end and took Gizmo away from them. They're extremely irresponsible. He told them the rules. Yeah, exactly. He told them the yeah. fucking rules. They fucking immediately shined light in his face. They immediately got water on him. And they immediately fed the other ones after midnight. <laughs> For a second, I thought you were still talking about the old Chinese man. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the the initial Chinese man scene is so over the top. Yeah, it, uh, oh my god, oh, yeah. it, it's almost rough. Like, it's, yeah, a couple of things haven't aged super well. Yeah. Like the the, the, the gong the, hit. <laughs> yeah, the, the gong accent. <laughs> Not the best, but once again, the set design that shop is awesome. Yeah, it's great. It is. Yeah, the whole back alley that he is in. I think it's in Hong Kong. Yeah. The whole back alley scene, yeah, just the way it's or lit. Chinatown. It, it, Chinatown, yeah, yeah. This uh, dark, mysterious antique shop with all of these really cool, eccentric items and toys and stuff. And then the dad immediately tries to sell him on one of his own inventions that immediately malfunctions and sprays toothpaste all over him. <laughs> it's, it sets a great precedent for the rest of the movie. Uh, especially because, like, it starts with his voiceover narration, like, almost like a noir film, which suits the, the opening scenes really well because the, the whole Chinatown area mm, is... Chinatown. Yeah, well, it's dark and smoky and neon lit, and, and to have this uh, this sort of voiceover narration over it, like a, like a Humphrey Bogart movie, and then he just, like, sprays toothpaste all over the place it's like okay well we know what we know what we're getting with this character i always love the uh performance of the dog in this movie oh especially yeah. at the good end boy. yeah especially at the end when the when the the gremlin's melting after he gets exposed to the sunlight the last gremlin oh yeah. and the way the dog responds to the melting gremlin and just the way he looks at it like it's it's the most like well acting dog that i think i've seen in a movie like that and the dogs from the thing they're like the two best acting dogs. <laughs> yeah, the dog is a very good boy. I'm glad that I'm glad that the dog survives. I'm glad Mrs. Deagle got what was coming. To her <laughs> exactly. <and yeah>. being, <laughs> being rocketed out of a window, <laughs> and and the dog triumphed in the end when the the gremlins hang the dog up in the Christmas lights on the front porch. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once again, very well-behaved, good-acting dog, because that, that could not have been a comfortable position for that dog to be in. I know, but right? Yeah. <laughs> obviously, took it like a champ. It, it's a cliche, but they just, don't, they just don't quite make movies like this anymore. Some things have changed for the better, some for the worse, but I'm, I'm glad that there's still movies with this kind of charm that we can go back and watch and appreciate. 
even though it's not explicitly like a Christmas themed film, it definitely has like the the warm fuzzy feel. Yeah, like yeah. I was about did. to say, yeah. you know, it it's not like in your face Christmas, but at the same time, it's that kind of lowish stakes sense of fun yeah. movie. That at least I know I'm all about in the yeah. Christmas season. Absolutely. So. Well, it's like even though the Gremlins do kill multiple people in this movie, it's assumed that like half the town's gone. Right. Exactly. Like it's it's truly apocalyptic. There's a death in toll, scale. and it's pretty big. But the Gremlins are so weird and funny and ki- and cute that like it's hard to take them seriously well that's the thing it's it has such a sense of slapstick and cartoonishness to all of it that you really can't take it that seriously right it's like it's the same kind of thing where you can watch joe pesci get smacked in the face with a paint can in Home Alone and it's it's low enough stakes where you can feel comfortable laughing at it and it's like well realistically that would have fucking <laughs> broken his nose knocked out some of his teeth and probably given him a pretty serious concussion <laughs> but you know I'm gonna laugh about it I have a bit of a story time if y'all don't mind story time Let's I have it. a uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast I have a, a very uh, strangely deep relationship with this movie having only seen it about twice. I grew up with my family running a small dance studio, and twice a year they'd put on productions for the schools and etc. One of their favorite shows they like to do, and they'd pull it out every couple of years, is Where the Wild Things Are. And for whatever reason, for their adaptation of Where the Wild Things Are, they decided to use the entirety of the Gremlin score for it. <laughs> now, it was my job uh, as, as a youth to uh, run sound and lights. I was there for all the rehearsals, all the performances for multiple years of of doing this show. So before I ever saw the movie, I never knew that that was the soundtrack that they used until I watched the film. And I was like, why do I know every note of this score? What is going on right now? I've never seen this movie before. This is some really weird deja vu. What the fuck? <laughs> like, well, like, even the slow moments, because like they do dance numbers. That's a da 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 da. Like all those bits, I I knew, and I was very confused. You're just for a why while. are they using the Wild Thing soundtrack <laughs> what for the this? Fuck is this? Like, yeah, I. Uh, like, like, it put me almost in, like, a panic state because, like, I'd heard those songs so many times over. It's like a Clockwork Orange effect. Like, <laughs> it's really funny. I gotta say, though, as many times as I've I've been forced to hear the soundtrack, I still love that score. Like, oh, it's, 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 it's classic it's fucking John amazing. Williams. Um, I think it's... Is it... It's it George be, uh, or... Jerry Burn? Goldsmith, I think. Jerry Goldsmith. Goldsmith? Okay. Yeah, Goldsmith. It's that same kind of orchestral... Yeah, exactly, you know, yeah. But there's a lot of, like, like wacky score. synths in there, and I love that, like, the like the kind of farty bass sounds and... Like you mentioned before, at one point we hear carolers singing Silent Night and the the gremlins do it. And then later when uh, Billy and his girlfriend are walking around town, there's like a minor key synth version of Silent Night playing, (laughs) which is a really great musical motif and callback. Uh, The score is fantastic. A lot of it is going to be stuck in my head for a while now, probably. Especially that main Gremlins theme. It's just so catchy. It is, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's an earworm. Yeah, absolutely. It just so perfectly personifies these little green shitheads. The whole time I was watching this movie, I just couldn't stop thinking, what little shitheads? They're just, they're just such little shits. <laughs> they're all the redheaded stepchildren. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's one song on that score that is entirely saved by the visuals, and that is, and you, you all, y'all are gonna disagree with me, but I can, I can guarantee you from multiple listens, it doesn't hold up, and that is the, that is the bar scene disco track, specifically titled "Mega Madness Super Badness," oh, um, yeah. uh, <laughs> because it says that repeatedly. Yes, now, during does. the scene, it's great, like it's fine, it works very well because. It is you are watching mega madness and super badness and that's fine but just hearing that repeated 
just in one song. Like, that's the only two lines. I love that it's, you just have oh. PTSD from years of hearing the soundtrack. I, I really do, over. though. Was that, was that one that they used to Mega Madness Super Badness? A lot. Oh. <laughs> no, it's their, it's their sign off number. They do it for a track in the middle, and then they also do it at the end. They loved it. They loved that song. And, yeah, you man. know, I, again, for one listen, for a one off, no hate to the, the, the writers, composers, and singers of that song. But, oh man, multiple listens is well, that, rough, man. I think you're right. Like, I love it in the context of the film uh, and the scene in which it, it occurs. But I don't think I would want to listen to it without the movie. I think I would get tired of Mega Madness, Super Badness pretty quick. You, you would. <laughs> <laughs> you would. Cool. Well, uh, then is it time to rate Gremlins? Yes, our last movie of the decade. That's right. That's right. We'll get to that more uh, in in a, in a few moments. But uh, first, John, why don't you start? What is your rating for Gremlins? Five stars. Five out of five. Easily. All right. No hesitation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Ben. Uh, for me, this is a super fun movie. Um, it's truly a classic. I'm going to give it a four out of five. I think it's a lot of fun. I don't think it's a perfect movie by any means, but it's a low stakes slapstick fun movie. Good to put on at any point. Cleveland? Um, uh, yeah, I have a lot of respect for the classics. But that being said, I, I try to not uh, give a film a, a high score simply because it's regarded as one. I try and go by my own singular opinion. That being said, my opinion is this movie fucking rocks. Five stars from me. I, lo I love this movie to bits. Nice. Uh, yeah, well, I, I very much enjoyed this on my first viewing. I don't have the uh, added benefit of nostalgia from growing up watching it. Or listening. Uh, or, li or listening. <laughs> um, I mean, plenty of it has been uh, ingrained in, in my brain from pop culture. Like, obviously, I went into this knowing the rules of the Gremlins. I know who Gizmo is. I, I know the basic gist of the film. Uh, but that being said, like, it was still a delight on, on a first watch. I agree with you, Ben. I don't think it's perfect. Uh, I think that a couple of times it suffers from some very very minor pacing issues, but overall a very fun, uh, like you said, low stakes, slapstick, comedy, horror to put on and uh, just enjoy. I consider this in a, in a very similar vein with Home Alone uh, for me in terms of holiday enjoyability. I'm going to give it a four out of five as well. Uh, and that will give Gremlins an average of four and a half out of five. Perfect movie for the Christmas spirit, and the holidays aren't over yet. If you haven't seen Gremlins, you still have time to watch it. Next week, we will not be talking about a singular film. As Ben mentioned, Gremlins is our final film of the decade and the year. Next week, we will be starting our uh, first of two-part uh, end of the year, end of the decade extravaganza. For the first part next week, we'll be breaking down our uh, top five films of 2019, uh, honorable mentions, worst films of 2019, and we will be doing the first half of our top 10 films of the decade. So stay tuned for that. It's a whole lot of fun. We already recorded it, so I know that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of mega madness and super badness. And super badness. <laughs> well, on that note, it is Christmas, and Christmas, much like all American holidays, is a consumer holiday. And in order to consume, we have to get paid. So, Cleveland, why don't you go to the sponsor shelf and tell us who our Christmas sponsor is for this week? Uh huh. Uh, yeah, our our sponsor shelf, the the shelf with the with the pre-written sponsors on it. That's that right. We have. We absolutely have. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going. All right. Clap. 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 The go. Eldritch Shelf, where we pull sponsors from the void. Indeed. And this week, uh, brought to you by The Void, is, um, uh, uh, uh sorry, the, the print's a little fine. Can, uh, John, do you, do you, uh, what is, there's a logo at the top. What's that a picture of? Uh, I just, I can't. I, I got nothing. I got nothing. God, what is that? I don't know that? what it says. It's, like, smeared. Um. Maybe uh, you should have dried it first. Yeah, I, I really should have, you know, it just, it, you know, I, I think I should it, know better. Like I, all the all the letters from the sponsor shelf are always damp. You know, it's just it's a side effect of the shelf. I think it says uh, Stevie Niblets, Turkey and Giblets. 
Oh yeah, that's, that's a, right. That's a weird sponsor. Oh yeah, yeah. Where where are your biblets for Stephen? Niblets. Niblets. Turkey giblets. Turkey and giblets. And giblets. Yeah. The giblets do not come from the turkey. Where do they come from? That's the Christmas surprise. <laughs> Secret recipe, well, thank you for baby. Uh, uh, salvaging the sponsorship, Tease. I really appreciate it. Well, um, we should really say thank you to Stevie Niblets for such a lucrative sponsorship opportunity. Don't go into your Christmas dinner without Stevie Niblets. Uh, he's lurky. he's a sinner. <laughs> 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 Uh, all right. Well, yeah, that'll bring us to the end of this week's episode. Yeah, thanks for listening to us chat about goblins. Goblins, gremlins, and ghouls. All of these things and more can be found on previous episodes of The Pod People. You can find those, you know, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you're currently listening to this. And make sure to give the Christmas gift of a five-star rating and <laughs> review and share the the love and the joy with the people around you. Put a pod people under your tree this year. Stuff some boys into your stockings. Um, Yikes. (laughs) Yikes. No, it's good. It's the gift gift that keeps on giving, Cleveland. Um, I gotta work on my Christmas spirit, I suppose. That's right. You you certainly do. You have some time, though. It's not yet Christmas. I'll, I'll go prep my stocking. You can follow us on Twitter at PodPeoplePod and at Letterboxd.com slash PodPeoplePod for a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to the corresponding episodes. Hit us up on Twitter and tell us, what's your favorite Christmas horror movie? Do you prefer Gremlins 1 or Gremlins 2? And in preparation for next week's episode, what are your favorite horror films of the decade? Or the year. Or the year. Or your least favorite. Just hit us up and tell us. You can follow me on Twitter at Deep State Ozzy. I'm at Mr. Sheets on Twitter. And I'm occasionally tweeting for Light Arc Studio uh, as we continue to develop our wonderful, wonderful indie title, It Stares Back. Go check it out. It's super fun. You know the drill. Hey, you can follow me on Letterboxd at Wow, That's Heavy. Wow, that's heavy. <laughs> it's a Back to the Future reference there for you. How heavy? <laughs> <laughs> that's very, a callback. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely check that out and, uh, follow, follow John on Letterboxd while you're also following the pod people. You can kill two birds with one stone and why wouldn't you for that price? It can't be beat. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Don't let the gremlins get into your electronics. That's right. We'll see you next week to talk about the best films of the year and the decade until then. Bye-bye.